afternoon, everyone. Welcome to High Water Women's second Impact Investing uh, webinar series. We're delighted to have you with us today for our Gender, Le Gender and Diversity Lens Investing session. Um, this session today is a part of a whole host of programming that we're beginning to launch that will roll out over the course of this year. Um, if you have been to our symposium in the past, this is our symposium basically quadrupled and spread out across the year. Um, and we are really looking to solidify and formalize our network. So we would love for you to join us in these conversations. The Accelerating Impact content will be organized around four main themes, climate change and climate justice, the impact investing portfolio, gender diversity and inclusion and place-based investing. And under each of these sessions, we will have a minimum of four online discussions, which we hope to also spin out additional conversations as we move along and, and projects that may be associated with that as well. But the goal is really to increase this field of impact investing and to help people who care about impact investing to do it more effectively. Um, so um, this is one of three programs that takes place out of High Water Women. Our mission is the economic empowerment of women and youth. And we do that through three main programs. So in addition to this Accelerating Impact program, we also have the Muriel Siebert Campaign for Financial Literacy, where we have a dedicated core of volunteers that we train and deploy across the tri-state area. And we hope to take that program nationally as well. Um, as you may imagine, we've also begun teaching those courses online. And we also have the annual backpack and gift drives that are designed to get kids back to school and ready to learn. And it really supports mothers and their families who can't afford to provide those things. Um, so I'm excited to get started today. I want to introduce you to Valerie, who is a member of our Young Women's Council, who's going to help you with the outline of how we're going to approach today. Valerie. Perfect. Um, so just wanted to run over some housekeeping rules for today. Um, the format for today's discussion is as follows. We've allocated 50 minutes for the conversation with our panelists today, and we'll open the floor for questions and answers for the remaining 40 minutes. And that should take us right to the 130 mark. The goal is to make the discussion as engaging and as interactive as possible. So we do welcome questions at any point during the session. Feel free to pose your questions using the chat box below, or you can raise your hand and we will unmute you when called upon so that you can ask your questions directly to the panelists. Um, feel free to keep your video on or off. Of course, we'd love to see all of your faces, but it's entirely up to you. And for those who are not speaking, please remain on mute. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Anna Snyder, who is our chair of the board for High Water Women. Thanks, Valerie. Um, so I'm joined here today by four amazing women um, who are pioneers and innovators in uh, the world of gender and diversity investing. Um, so uh, before we before we introduce the panelists, just want to set like frame today's discussion. Um, so really, the reason that we're starting the series of discussions is that if we're going to address economic inequality in our society we as investors have to start with looking at who our capital is allocated to. So as I think we all know, right now, the system is working fine for the people who designed it, uh, but it's not working for anyone and it's not seemingly working for a lot of people. And to change that, we need to be more inclusive around both who receives capital and, how, and, and also who gets to allocate capital. I'm sure that you're seeing many lists that are coming out around buying from uh, small businesses and minority owned businesses. Um, and that's targeted to you as the consumer. Today, we're gonna talk about you as the investor and your institution and your constituents as the investors and how to also uh, think about diversifying your portfolio in a different way than we normally talk about investment diversification, but I think as important uh, and you'll see why. So let me uh, turn it over to uh, Suzanne Beagle, uh, Catherine Benat, 
Joanne Corcoran and Haran Getachew. And uh, if you would all introduce yourselves, uh, a little bit about yourselves and um, a bit about your organization and your work in this space, that would be wonderful. Okay, hi, Suzanne Beagle calling in from London. I'm the co-founder, co-producer of the Gender Smart Investing Summit. And also I go as catalyst at large I've been investing with the gender lens for 20 years, and my organization is focused on moving more capital, more strategically, with more impact and more velocity with a gender lens. And I'm so glad to be part of this. I got a chance to speak at High Water Women about three, four years ago, and it's just great to be back with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joanne Corcoran. I'm one of the managing partners of Golden Seeds. Golden Seeds is a U.S. nationwide network of individual investors, about 300 individual investors and some affiliated venture funds. We started it 15 years ago. Um, we were one of the first groups who was focused on investing in gender diverse management teams. And for us, that means that there has to be at least one woman in the C-suite um, with a power position and the appropriate amount of equity. We're not, a, um, we're not a double bottom line fund. We invest in companies on the same basis as anybody else. We've invested about $135 million since we've started, and our companies have gone on to raise um, about a billion and a half dollars from some of the uh, largest and most well-respected venture and private equity and strategic partners in the country. Thank you so much. Catherine. Good morning, everybody. For those of you who, for whom it is morning, good afternoon for those of you overseas. <clears throat> My name is Catherine Benant. I'm the Managing Director at RBC Global Asset Management, where I am the Head of Responsible Investing in the US. My primary mission is to act as ambassador for U.S. asset owners in particular on the topic of responsible investing most broadly. Uh, we recognize that uh, there are both value reasons, there's a value proposition for investing this way and there's a values-oriented lens. Uh, we're here today to talk about the values-oriented lens uh, and the fact basically that it certainly doesn't mean you're giving up any value. I think trying to adjust that that view and 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 really that all dollars have an impact positive and negative we think of money as neutral but as investors we should start thinking about the fact that actually our money does have an impact and it can drive a lot of, of positives that we personally care about uh, in, in the world and we should keep that in mind as we move forward in our investing and it's an honor to be here with such an extraordinary group of women. Thanks, Catherine. Hera. Hi, good morning. I'm joining you all from the Bay Area here in California. I'm working as VP of Investments at Illumin Capital. Illumin Capital is a fund of funds, so we invest into the world's top venture growth equity and private equity funds with an ESG lens. So we're looking for funds that are making social impact we actually benchmark ourselves against um, the traditional venture benchmarks and believe that you can earn market rate returns while investing with impact. In addition to that, we invest with a gender and racial equity lens. So we look to fund um, both diverse fund managers, who, which we define as women and people of color, as well as non-diverse fund managers and take both sets of fund managers through a coaching process, which is informed through uh, evidence-based uh, techniques we've developed with Stanford University and a group of social psychologists there. And our coaching is focusing on reducing implicit bias. We believe that investing with this ESG lens, with the gender lens, with the racial equity lens, not only will lead to market rate returns, but will actually drive higher returns. I'd be happy to share more about the study that we did with Stanford and why we're so focused on implicit bias and reducing it throughout the fund life cycle. Yeah, it's a, an amazingly interesting study uh, that, that you did with Stanford. So I, I can't wait to dig into that uh, during this discussion a bit more. Um, all right, so let's let's um, 
discuss what uh, what we mean by gender lens or di uh, investing with a diverse lens or, or inclusive investing. There are lots of different ways to describe this and actually lots of different ways that investors can think about it across asset classes. So we've seen in the public markets, you know, um, sort of uh, gender strategies where they're looking at C-suite investors, you know, a lot of you are in the uh, either early stage or um, growth stage of, of private equity and venture. Um, you know, uh, Catherine spent a, a good part, part of her career in fixed income and, and, and has been um, thinking about uh, uh, economic equality and, and, and those types of solutions. But how do you, like, what are the different approaches that um, uh, the participants here can start thinking about when you're thinking about how to invest with a diverse lens, right? Um, so what are, the, what are the different ways to do that? Let, let's spend a little time on that just so we ground everyone in, in the next part of the conversation. So I, I think, Anna, you've, you've really summarized it. Is it um, who's investing the dollars or is it where the dollars go? And both are absolutely relevant. Um, and, and certainly uh, I will pass it on to uh, my, uh, more informed colleagues about who's investing the dollars. But as far as where the dollars go, it is absolutely possible to, to invest in companies that, or in securities that support women uh, of, of all kinds, and whether it's public markets or private markets, that is an option. And making sure that's understood and on the table, I think it's very important to this discussion. So, um Suzanne here. Um, one way to think about this is you could be thinking about diverse owned firms or diverse portfolio managers. In, in my case, I'm also thinking about it, those that also fit that, but also have a gender lens in their underlying investments and in their process. Um, we can be thinking about whether you lead with gender, but you don't have to be leading with gender to be thinking about where gender is a factor of analysis, either for spotting risk or for opportunity across anything. Um, you can be thinking about um, the target of investments going into diverse owned businesses, businesses that are good for women in terms of employment, supply chain, products and services, um, really thinking across the whole value chain. Um, and there are people who are definitely thinking about the policies and practices um, within firms and funds as much as the what. So the what and the how both really matter. And we can be thinking offensively, but where is investing in women just smart? And it's a great market opportunity to be paying attention. But we can also be thinking defensively about where are we really um, potentially having risks by not paying attention to these factors, whether that is by not paying attention to talent and what talent needs to be able to be attracted and stay, um, or the risks of gender-based violence or the risks of not um, for example, accommodating things like childcare um, as a factor of whether people can get to work, something that where I think the world finally, you know, in the, in the wake of COVID, which has such a nightmare in so many ways, maybe if there's a silver lining is maybe people waking up a little bit to some of the realities that we need to be thinking about. Yeah, we're going to discuss a little bit about how, um, among other things, uh, you know, COVID has accelerated, I think, some of the trends, but also some of the um, urgency uh, in this space um, that, that uh, we, that, so we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Um, any, any other views from the panelists on sort of what, what, what comprises inclusive or diverse or gender lens investing? Okay, I thought that could set a good stage. Um, Anna, can I just add one more yeah, thing? Please. I really feel like for quite some time, the conversation was leaving out intersectionality as an articulated part of the strategy. And I think this year, the other thing that has really come out is that we, we can't just be talking about gender, we need to be talking about race and class and um, uh, to LGBT issues and other, again, whether you're spotting opportunities because of who's the innovator, who's the leader, or whether you're thinking about the other lenses that we were talking about, I just think that's essential to be adding to the mix, obviously with the panel that we have too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we are we are a non-diverse panel because we're all women. So I do wanna call that out, um, but, <laughs> but, but you know, it, it's generally the other way around in, in, in the finance industry. Um, uh, so uh, so I, I, will, I really wanna get into this, sorry, um, Heron, yeah, I'd love to jump in and um, I think take a step back a little bit to, yeah. to share some t statistics on why this is important. I think 
you know, for me, it's really strange to have a term called gender lens, right? Why, why isn't this just normal investing? Um, but I think what we need to call out is that um, of the about 70 trillion in assets that are under management on behalf of governments, uh, universities, charities, foundations, public pensions, et cetera, of that only 1.3% is managed by, by women and people of color led firms. Um, and what that means is that at the LP to GP level, there aren't women and people of color in um, decision-making seats, right? So there aren't a lot of partners. Um, and then from the LP to GP level, that really affects um, who is making these decisions, right? Who's writing these checks from the GP to entrepreneur level that then trickles down further, right? So the statistics we usually hear are that 2.2% per, of funding goes to women-led startups. And if we're talking about intersectionality, uh, women of color-led startups receive less than 0.2% of that. And if you're a black woman, you receive 0.0006% of that, right? So the question is, why do we need a gender lens? And that's because, you know, even though there's been emerging more and emerging manager programs for the past uh, 30 years, we haven't seen this 1.3% number move at all. So if you're looking at the US population, the number of uh, fund managers um, who are men, who are women, who are people of color, who are not, should really reflect the US population. What's preventing um, the asset management world from actually reflecting what we expect based on a normal curl? So I think that's why we're calling it as a, as a gendered lens um, because you really need to make a conscientious effort to to address these structural issues. Yeah, we will. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add on a little bit to what Heron said that we had golden seeds. We have one benchmark. We want to invest in companies that have gender diverse management. Our rule is there has to be one woman in the C-suite in a hiring job with the right amount of equity. You can't have three partners and the woman has 1% equity and everybody else has you know, 40%. Um, that's it, we don't have any other requirements. And yet I look back and if I do keep statistics on our portfolios, we have over 35% of the directors in our company are female. Um, over 30% of the C-suite is female. Um, women in the companies, even though some of these are very large companies, have equity positions, um, a higher amount of equity than in a typical company. All of those things happened, not because we asked it to happen or required it to happen, but because we had women in decision-making positions. And diversity tends to come when diverse people make decisions. Yeah. Well, this leads me to a really good. Uh, sorry, I was going to say this leads me to I think a really good point, uh, which is uh, so to juxtapose what what Aaron and and, and Joanne just said. So we've seen we we've seen in some ways little to no progress if if the stats. Uh, but but then we, your Joanne, you're saying you've seen some progress, right? In that when you actually do intentionally invest where women are decision makers then that sort of organically happens um you know and and that's i i suppose uh progress but what uh, you all have worked in this space for a, a long time what what would you say what, what are the progress what, what is the progress we've seen and then we'll get into some of the the hurdles to to even more progress open it up for anyone who wants oh, I'll, I'll start um so as I mentioned, Golden Seeds is this large network of individual investors. We were founded in 2005 and based on the, the simple investment thesis that gender diverse teams build and enable more successful companies. And we took this, even in 2005, there was already a wealth of um, public equity market research that associated diversity of any kind with financial outperformance on a lot of different measures. So we took that wealth of data and we extrapolated it to the private markets. And now since then, there have been in the last few years, there have been some studies on the private markets that show that diversity leads to similar out measures of some measures of outperformance. 
So, you know, this, what we believe is a powerful idea has really formed our 15 years of funding women-led companies. And, you know, we're proud of some of the progress that we made to date. And on the other hand, we are still completely humbled by the challenges of achieving real parity for female entrepreneurs in the private equity markets. It's, uh, so I mean, after all this time, more than 85% of venture capital still goes to all male teams with only about 3% going to female teams in the US. In the angel market though, there's been um, substantially more progress. And um, the, the US, in the US, the angel markets are not trivial. Um, last year, they invested about $24 billion. Prior to um, the, lack, the dearth of IPOs, the angel and venture markets were about the same. It's only the last seven or eight years since um, changes in your ability to do an IPO that the venture market has really grown, and a lot of that's late, later stage investing. But so last year, $24 billion was invested in the angel market. 20% of the companies funded were female-led. And that compares to only 4% 15 years ago when we started. Now, I want to take responsibility for that, but I, you know, it's, you know, I'm sure we helped, but there's been lots of other things that helped. And um, one of the factors that we believe has really changed the angel markets is that the percent of women who identify as angel investors has climbed over the course of the last 15 years. In 2004, only 5% of the individuals describing themselves as angel investors in the US were women. This percentage last year was 29%. So of course, this is, you know, those numbers, four to 20, five to 29. It's not causation, it's correlation, but the increase in women making this, the decisions about to whom those checks are going to go suggest the ability, you know, a subversion of some of the implicit bias that we saw when we started Golden Seeds and um, uh, homophily sort of changing a little bit. So um, as, Heron, as Heron said, who makes the decisions really matters. Dan, I know you have some thoughts here too. I do, I do. We just finished um, two, two pieces of research. One I do with Veris Wealth Partners, um, which I think maybe some people heard about earlier in the year on the public market side, and then Wharton Business School, Wharton Social Impact Initiative. Um, and I just finished a project, Project Sage 3.0, which is on the private market side. And thank you to Bank of America and Visa Foundation for supporting that work. On the public market side, we've been tracking this over the past 10 years. Um, and this year, um, we had gone from 25 funds and, and structured vehicles on the public market side to then 35 in 2018 to 2019, over 54 um, funds and structured vehicles on the public market side, representing about a 2.4 to $3.4 billion jump. Um, and then uh, now, even just since that research was done, and, and that's through summer of 2019, um, there are at least another five to 10 new vehicles that have launched um, from some you know, significant players like Lizard and, um, and others that uh, one wouldn't necessarily immediately think of as gender, you know, naturally gender forward. Um, on the private market side, and that's just with labeled gender lens mandate vehicles. And so that doesn't include the Trilliums and Boston Commons and Waldens and, uh, and others that are, um, don't have a labeled strategy, but they're doing really excellent work around gender as part of ESG and how they engage in the boardroom. On the private side, um, we just published two days ago, um, that going from 58 funds to 87 funds to now this year through the end of December, 2019, um, 138 funds. And again, jumping from a billion, 1.1 billion to 2.2 billion to now 4.8 billion raised. Um, but with a total capital raise target of over 8 billion across these private market funds. And those are venture capital, private equity, private debt, um, some real estate funds, which for, for the first time, it's a new category for us. And the, the size, the shape, the structure, Illumin is in there as a fund of funds. So we have two fund of funds. 
um, but we also are looking at revenue, those that are doing different types of capital, not just looking for unicorns, but looking for zebras and looking for normal growth businesses. Um, and this is on a global basis. I think signs of progress you asked for also, 67 funds, um, uh, 65 funds, 47% of those funds launched in 2019. So there is so much growth that's happening. And there are, if you look across funds, ones, twos, threes, and fours, there are more and more funds that are also at the hundred to $500 million level. So many people assume that a gender lens fund is going to be under a hundred, but, and there are beautiful examples, golden seeds is in this um, as well in the hundred plus uh, range. And I think um, what, what people don't realize is yes, we have so many headwinds against us. Yes. Only still less than 3% venture capital going to women, but on the flip side, so much more diversity in who is doing the investing and then what are they investing in? And, and I'd love to jump in and, um, you know, I'm really heartened to see all the, the good progress that Joanne and, and Suzanne shared with the number of uh, women-led funds that are out in the market, um, raising larger fund sizes. I think at um, our vantage point, which is the LP level, we do see that there are a lot of uh, women-led fund and diverse-led funds in the market. I think the issue that we've noted is that, you know, the misconception has previously been that there's a pipeline issue there aren't enough talented uh, women-led funds or diverse-led funds, or there aren't enough funds of a certain size to invest in. Uh, but I'd like to point out that, you know, the study that we penned uh, along with Stanford University actually showed that it's not a pipeline issue. There's been funds for decades who have been top decile, top quartile performers, right? So when we penned the study, we uh, surveyed over 200 asset allocators across different asset classes and presented to them two high-performing teams and two low-performing teams. We kept all 14 variables of a, a pitch sheet uh, static. So the track record, the returns of that fund, uh, the pedigree of the investors, um, the asset class they're investing in, the theme, et cetera. Essentially, it was an identical fact sheet. And the only difference was the picture of the team that was leading it. So in one uh, fact sheet, we presented a homogeneous team. In another fact sheet, we presented a team with an element of diversity. And what we found is that LPs actually have a harder time in assessing the competency of a team that's not homogeneous. Um, and the team that is actually higher performing and diverse faces more hurdles in fundraising. Um, so when they were evaluated based on their investment skill set, their competence, their social fit, um, the investors were less likely to be convinced by their track record. And we also found that um, diverse teams that were lower performing get more benefit of the doubt, but less. Funding. And the reason I bring up this study is that it shows it's not really a pipeline problem. Even when these really high performing women led funds are presented to LPs, um, there's a disconnect, and we, which we think is driven by implicit bias um, between which funds uh, come to, into the room to pitch and which funds are being allocated dollars. So although there are, you know, a great number of more funds in the market, we see that there are issues, um, one at the implicit bias level and two at the various processes and, and hurdles funds have to jump that are informed by these uh, biases that prevent women from raising equal size funds um, with you know, equal uh, performance or track records if they raise any dollars at all. Uh, I'd be happy to, to jump into examples later on, but I think although there's a lot of great news, there's still um, a large, um, issue in the market, which is how do you move this 1.3% number? Absolutely. We're going to get into the hurdles, which I know, unfortunately, we could spend probably the next 10 days talking about. Um, but um, but uh, Catherine, I know you wanted to jump in here around uh, either progress or hurdles, because I know we're hurtling into the hurdles <laughs> section here um, uh, very quickly. I don't wanna, yeah, yeah, I don't want to talk about the hurdles. I really want to underscore what is a potential irony in some of the stuff Heron's been saying. Okay, and the irony is how hard it is for women and people of color to get into a position, A, to be a portfolio manager, A, to be a fund manager, and B, to be able to launch on their own and go out and raise money. And all of the hurdles they had to jump to get there, um, which means they had to be probably, you should at least ask the question, didn't they all have to be extraordinarily good to get to that point? Not just average good, or not just good good, 
or not even great, but extraordinarily good because they beat so many odds. It's like, okay, they got the gold medal at the Olympics in the, in the marathon. And now we're saying, well, I don't really know if they can make it. And so for me, I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm saying, I think um, it's probably worthwhile thinking about putting that on the table when you look at these teams. So, yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's um, tease this, this out a little bit more. So, um, you know, Heron and, and is talking about just having the, the deck stacked against you w when people can see you. <laughs> um, so that's a major hurdle, but you know, the, 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 the common, you know, so, so the common hurdles um, I, I think in this, in, 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 it are, you know, as Suzanne referenced, uh, fund size um, and or uh, the length of the track record or the size of the firm and worries about um, whether the firm is going to make it because a lot of these, you know, if you're spinning out, you know, you're, you're sort of living fund to fund um, and, and, and that, you know, is, is a risk that investors um, sometimes feel uncomfortable with. But let, let's, let's sort of, let, there are so many hurdles, but let's sort of talk about, in your opinion, what the major hurdles are to getting more capital directed to um, these types of solutions. And, and these types of solutions, meaning the, the allocators, the allocated to um, across every asset class, um, what, what, are the, what, what do you feel are like just the major uh, points where we need to think about this thing in a completely different way? Well, just to pick up on what Heron said, bias and unconscious bias. I mean, let's just talk about, you know, the conscious bias and the unconscious bias. People will say, well, it's not in our investment policy statement. And by the way, it's, you know, even ESG being in people's investment policy statements is under attack right now, despite all the incredible evidence that we have. Um, the lack of, um, you know, the inertia, uh, the, not, um, the, the fact that people don't even know these products exist and, and the mythology that people have around whether it's first time fund managers or whether that is women um, or whether that is people investing consciously with a gender lens. I mean, we, we, did, we did 14 interviews as part of Project Sage, and we just heard it all. I mean, the, the stories are just quite extraordinary, but they're nothing new, I think, to the people on this call. Um, I think there's a lack of imagination of people realizing, I think about the portfolio companies in Golden Seeds, for example, of the you know, smart technology and deep life sciences and things that are um, the essential um, businesses that are not, um, they're not pink. Um, and yet people will sort of go to hearing um, and thinking, oh, I'm hearing gender, it must be small. And as Jackie Vanderbreg would say from Bank of America, small, it must be small and soft and pink. Uh, and so just the, um, you know, the need to um, make sure that people understand what it is we're actually talking about um, are some of the barriers. And then just the, honestly, the fund size and the track record issue um, and the, um, even to the level of if a woman can't um, or a team of women uh, because they didn't, they weren't being highly paid in their previous roles and they didn't have carry in their previous firms and funds, they may not have the capital to put the GP commit together. Um, and so just those barriers. Uh, but the, when somebody says, well, I can't be more than 20% of a fund and I can't put less than 100 million to work and therefore I can't look at less than a capital raise under, than, under half a billion, then you take all those funds that are underneath uh, and just sweep them off the table. So, I mean, there, those are just some of the ones I'm hearing about a lot. Yeah. Well, and certainly while I was at the New York City pension plan and having been on the side of a big public pension plan and seeing that, it's, that's absolutely the case. It's the track record issue and the size issue. And then when you get to scale, you're no longer part of an emerging manager program. And so when you can get real material dollars uh, it, it becomes a, a, a set of different challenges in a different field. And so I think there's some systemic uh, hurdles, hurdles to get over that, that we have not solved for. Um, absolutely. And I'll add to that, um, when we're looking at emerging management programs specifically, I think there's a lot of inconsistency in terms of how um, they're defining the word emerging, right? Um, there was a study conducted by the Diverse Asset Managers Initiative where they surveyed um, 33 firms. Of those 33 uh, consultants, I think only about seven to nine responded. And even amongst those seven, um, there were significant 
variations in terms of how they defined emerging versus diverse. And in a lot of cases, emerging manager programs indicate a size restriction. So for example, if your fund is less than 2 billion, then it's considered emerging. Um, whereas there's other funds that de define it as uh, ones that specifically target women and people of color, but once they grow to a certain size, they're no longer eligible. So what we've seen is that the beneficiaries of these emerging manager programs for the past 30 years have really been white male-led teams that have spun out from larger funds who've had backing from their previous um, partnership, right? So this actually hasn't really consistently um, increased the allocation that goes to women and people of color-led funds. So I think um, the processes themselves or the restrictions that uh, Suzanne and Catherine mentioned in terms of the fund size or the GP commit um, or how you're even defining what emerging um, counts as is really, um, I think, inhibiting progress within the, the larger LP community. Um, I, I, we raise most of our money from a high net worth individuals, um, not institutions. And um, there's this uh, kind of implicit bias that has nothing to do with these in, uh, institutional constraints, which are very true at the, at the institutional side. Um, and one of these is that it's the yoga it's the yoga pants and baby food kind of bias that people think that since we're investing in female founders, that those companies are going to be focused on uh, food and family and who knows what. Um, and it is really interesting to me because if you just think about it, women in the U.S. have for over a decade more than a decade, I think two decades now, have been earning about 50% of the US STEM degrees. And those women are out there and they're starting companies all across the board and they don't have anything to do with yoga pants. Um, for instance, in our portfolio in just the last couple of years, we've invested in a company called Cadenza Innovations. It's a, the next generation uh, battery technology. It's a way to pack battery uh, power units really close together to get rid of um, cascading fire risk. She's a chemical engineer. She already has, uh, is manufacturing two of the largest battery manufacturers in the world. We invested with two, uh, a biomedical engineer and a neurosurgeon. They have the first FDA approved diagnostic for concussion tracks your eyes with gaming technology. Don't need a baseline. They're telling people if they have concussions all across the country. Um, we have a company, another woman. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a clinical stage biotech company focused on neurological diseases. She just received the largest grant ever given out by the National Institute of Aging for their lead candidate on Alzheimer's disease. Largest one ever given out. And, and just one more example. And we also invested in Paradigm 4. Um, computer science, they uh, founder. It is a technology. It's a, what it's, I want to describe it easily. It is a, um, it is a array database that allows you to, that allows researchers to look at huge amounts of data. Their company recently had a press release that they did 1 billion linear regressions in under an hour. That's a world record, and they think they can scale from there. They sell to pharma companies. These are all, these are women. There's no yoga pants. And we need to, I don't know how to do it, but we, I'd like to move beyond that um, so that we can get to some of these other more systemic problems. I want to, I want to, honor that and also say that in the face of COVID and everything that's coming up around the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, um, that healthcare, online education and education access and financing, food security and, and food systems um, and reliable systems, um, financial inclusion, the care economy, these I think are being elevated in the public eye 
of being dramatically underinvested in as well. And so I think that um, we should be able to have, with, as with an all investment, um, a nuanced approach and a diverse approach to what good investment looks like. And the thing that I've been thinking about very much is in this moment, where are the places to make those bets? Um, they're really what the what are the products and services that that the that the country and the and the planet really needs right now? And you can be leading with a climate lens. And I'm high water women. I know is going to do a whole session on climate um, with a gender lens. So I think the the other misperception is that people think, oh, you must be talking about only backing women entrepreneurs or only backing women in one particular way. No, you can be thinking about where women are across the whole picture. Um, in terms of those different dimensions of employment and products and services and customers and value chains um, with um, leading with the things that we need to be caring about. I'm getting a, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat room around a, uh, I think a, something that's been cited in, in, in our prep calls but as a major hurdle, which is the, uh, uh, m my chosen profession actually, which is <laughs> intermediary. Um, so consultants and advisors um, and how, you know, and, and, and how investors who are interested in doing this need to, um, you know, need to maybe even start with their advisor or consultant um, and, and either educate or inform them of solutions to your point, um, Suzanne, uh, and, and, and really sort of talk about you know, what their risk tolerance is um, around this uh, per per perceived versus uh, real risk tolerance, uh, at least um, by the advisor and by the, by the uh, consultant to the client. Um, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, the and, and, and in, there's, there are also some questions around emerging manager programs. I think that they, they've been a source of um, <laughs> some of the hurdles, even though their goal is to be uh, allocators, right? Uh, so, so let's let's talk about the sort of intermediary um, uh, set of hurdles and what what people can do to start um, unlocking capital that that where people are telling them no, that's not that's you know that's not really good for you. That's really not good for you. That that's play money, right? Uh, if you have nice play money, you can invest in that stuff, but that's not for your regular portfolio. Like, how do you how have you seen successfully combating that? Um, just a very quick comment, and then I will hand it over to, to as, as you handed it to Suzanne, I think she's a really good place to start. It's the, the inbound requests are really important this year. Mm -hmm. You must make inbound requests. Yeah. And then when those inbound requests get a tipping point, it becomes part of the business. But it, ha it is very often client driven. I care about this, I wanna know what you're doing about this. I care about this, I'd like to know your expertise. It is, and, and we talked about in this in, our, in, in some of our prep conversations, we actually, every one of us in every way has more power in this than we are exercising. So if you're listening to this panel and you care about this panel, you need to think about ways you can do it. And whether it's your personal financial advisor or your, your, your corporate finance, uh, consultant, Asking about this is super important and helps, and every drop of water affects it. That's mine. I just want to echo and add on to that, Catherine. Every, um, you know, with Gender Smart, we have 40 banks and investment banks and pension funds and development finance institutions who are backing our initiative, and our, and our audience represents uh, more than 14 trillion in capital. Um, when I hear a Tracy Gray, uh, who is on the, she's chief, uh, the head of the investment committee for one of the Cal State colleges, say that they basically just went to their investment consultant and said, we want a gender lens and a racial and ethnic diversity lens across our whole portfolio. If you're not gonna give it to us, we're going to take our portfolio somewhere else. Um, that was, that's power. When the Ms. Foundation says, we have an endowment and we're going to take our portfolio to someone who's gonna be able to deliver the complement of public and private market um, opportunities that we need, um, that's power. And so I think that um, one of the places, to your point, when asset owners ask for it, that's a piece of it. And I think a sign of light is when you've got Cambridge Associates writing a report about gender lens investing, which for so many years, that wasn't the voice that you were hearing. You, weren't, you were not hearing the voice of the investment consultants. And so 
the reports from Bank of America, from Morgan Stanley, from UBS, from the Cambridge Associates of the world, it, all of that matters because then, then a client can also turn around and say, I'm not, I'm not just making this up, it's right here. Right. So I think that's key. But, but boy, just because, I mean, I've had this conversation with some of these advisors, just because they know it doesn't mean that there are 16,000 uh, sales agents know it. Right. Um, and so how do you permeate it? throughout an organization of advisors and consultants is I think that's part of the how that we have to be about right now. Well, just a quick footnote about that. I spoke on a panel uh, three weeks ago and there were a thousand financial advisors on the call. And the organizer said, we have never seen so much interest from financial advisors in our materials and our, in our, in our um, webinars. Um, and it is our sense that the clients are really pushing them to know about this and they have been caught flat footed and they're desperate to learn more. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will agree. I'll, I, and I'm not a panelist, but I'll just jump in here. The, the number of requests that I'm getting from my team is getting from advisors um, on what are the, what are the funds that have a racial equity lens? What are the funds that are diverse managed? What are, you know, where can I allocate to, um, women and 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 people of color led businesses um, have have skyrocketed. Um, not not even just. I mean, before I mean, it, it was happening, but again, like as as in many cases, um, COVID and the social justice uh, movement have have accelerated this in a really in, in, and it is time. You know, it is time to sort of take advantage of of you know all of the work. <laughs> You guys have been doing um, here. So let, let um, uh, let's let's actually move into what are some of the innovative, uh, what are some of the solutions and the innovations that you're really excited about um, in this space? Uh, what what are the what are some of the things that you think are going to help overcome these hurdles? Well, I'm really excited about Illumin, so I'm excited to hear what Heron has to say as a solution, as a structural solution. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Suzanne. So we really um, structured ourselves as a fund of funds because we saw that there was a large gap in the market. On one end, you have these LPs, uh, larger institutions who have various restrictions, whether it's size or the capacity on their staff to look into funds that are um, smaller in size or maybe ones that are, they're not familiar with. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of talented women and people of color who are leading funds, who are starting new funds or um, second, third, fourth, fifth generation funds, but despite their performance are encountering, are encountering bias um, in terms of how much investment they receive, if, if they receive any investment at all. So the reason we structured ourselves as a fund of funds was really to fill this gap in the market and, and to be this intermediary where we'll actually go into the market, um, go through all of the you know, so many hundreds of funds that are out there and pick the top performing funds. Um, but beyond, you know, just the selection um, problem that we solve of giving you a diversified portfolio across um, asset class, vintage year, geography, um, impact theme, we're also solving um, the problem that both the GPs and LPs have, which is how do you reduce this implicit bias? So we worked with Stanford University Spark Center to create a custom curriculum for each fund throughout the life of their fund, they're undergoing training on a quarterly annual basis on various elements of their investment process, their board construction process, their hiring, promotion, and partnership level processes um, so that they're actually uh, able to realize even additional returns, what we call the diversity dividend. So we believe that these funds can perform better when un undergoing our training. Um, at the same time, we're also training the LPs that invest into us on how they can reduce biases in their processes so that they're actually able to see more qualified funds, um, whether they have consultants or not. So we really think that this um, intermediary role is an important one because maybe the LPs don't have as much capacity um, to go into the market and, and dig through all the opportunities. Um, and then as an LP ourselves, we're, we're more flexible and more understanding in terms of the nuances that uh, women and diverse led funds face. And I think a fund of funds in this sense makes so much sense, right? Because if we're talking about issues of scale, right, and institutional investors not being able to put, you know, 10 or $20 million into a fund that's $100 million for, you know, good reason in, in many cases to, to, 
you know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, this, this is a, the, the, this aggregation of capital, whether it's through fund of funds or other platforms, I think that are, that are uh, being, becoming structured for this is a huge way to at least get over a lot of those hurdles and, and the work you're doing on implicit bias with the managers who, by the way, are already diverse, but themselves might have implicit bias, right? Um, I think is really, is really interesting. Um, who, who else wants to jump in on things you're excited about? I'd love to add that um, Institutional Leadership Network, ILPA, and some other sort of industry bodies um, are making commitments, launching um, working groups, launching steering committees around this topic. Um, and, you know, ILN represents, it's about, a, it's about 14 big asset uh, managers who represent 16 trillion in capital. Um, this is not like, again, it's not small and soft and pink. This is serious. And they've, they're looking at climate, they're looking at gender and inclusivity and saying, what do we need to do as a set of pension, primarily pension funds um, to change the game here? Now, many of the people who are raising money today are impatient for them to like get a move on already. <laughs> Like, good, have your working groups, but like, we're, write the checks and the, you know, make the hire send the wire. Like, what are we doing right this minute? Um, but I think that uh, what's exciting for me, I mean, having been in this for, you know, seriously for 10 years, but overall for 20, is that at least when these kind of initiatives, some really credible players come up and say, we've got to solve for this, that's another piece of it. I think the other thing is when you have um, some visionary family offices and visionary foundations and visionary pension funds who say, we're just going to do it and we're gonna challenge other people in our circle to do it. The development finance institutions have launched this thing called the 2X challenge and that was to move from 2018 to 2023 billion in capital with a gender lens. They've just announced their numbers are 4.5 billion that they've moved and they're now going to be announcing a really significant commitment for 2021 to 23 and bringing in the multilaterals and challenging corporates and pension funds um, to do the same. I did a study on um, corporate venture capital, which is about 60 billion um, in capital across 1500 pools of corporate venture capital. Only about a dozen have any conversation, any articulated strategy around gender or diversity. And so my hope is that um, the, the positive signs of somebody like a Salesforce and an SAP and a Microsoft coming out and saying, this matters, this is smart investing, um, will then influence the others in their tribe, in their sort of peer circle. Joanne, you had um, mentioned, uh, sorry, thanks Suzanne for that, but Joanne, you had mentioned um, that, that LPs have to start breaking the rules. And I think whether it's private equity or any other asset class, um, there, you know, what, but have you seen any sort of, you know, obviously Golden Feet <laughs> was created for that very uh, effect, but, but, um, but have you, you know, have you seen, what have, what have you, what have you seen sort of in, in terms of innovation or progress around, you know, LPs breaking their own rules and, and success around that? And I'd ask the same, you know, with Catherine. I, I don't want to be flippant about um, institutional LPs having rules. Um, I, you know, I, I know what that is, that's fine. institutional <laughs> LPs have to, you know, they have limited budgets. They can't afford to be putting out small blocks of money and not having it, you know, followed in their streams and processes. Um, I think it's hard for them to break the rules. And um, fund to funds is one way to do it. Um, I think that where they can, hiring, um, somebody specifically to work on this and having them manage that piece internally using the same set of guidelines, but um, based off of a smaller asset base is another way to do it. Um, the fund of funds idea is a great idea. You always get pushback um, on the fees, even though you pay the fees because you're not doing the work internally, the administration work internally. But those are really the only things that I've seen um, people doing. And I, I love all this stuff that you guys are talking about. Maybe we'll start to see more people come up with some creative ideas inside of institutional boundaries and uh, restrictions. I mean, another little, and I, Catherine, I know you wanna go, but just another little ray of hope. <laughs> So in the in California, it was illegal for the pension funds the, um, to use race or 
gender as a factor of analysis in making allocation decisions. And there's a group of investors that have come together to say that, well, we just have to get that legislation changed. And so now, just in the last two months, there's some good news around that. And um, people are saying, why, why do we have this legislated? And it was originally put in place to protect people <laughs> from discrimination. But actually now it's just like, that's an outmoded thing. And it's actually reverse working in the reverse. But there was a group of people who said, look, this, this thing is on the books that for no good reason, now we need to change it. And so that things like that, there again, it's not changing the allocations in July, 2020, but it's a sign of hope to me. Um, I was going to talk about reg regulatory hurdles and that sometimes pension funds. So Suzanne and I were completely on the same page as, uh, in, in terms of bringing that up. And I don't think California is the only state, but certainly um, in, in public pension plan world, where you're under the microscope, you need to be very careful about your, uh, your, your, your decision making process and, and how you, you keep it uh, um, uh, un unimpeachable. Um, uh, and, and certainly with regulation around it, there is some systemic bias um, built into the system that we need to get over sometimes and some of it's um, governmental. So, um, as well as I think we had one question come across the, the screen, do the people who care about it at the pension funds actually uh, have the authority to do that? Um, and whether or not they have the personal authority to do that, they have the authority their voices really loud and consistently to keep it on the table at all times so that people, if they are not the decision makers, the decision makers feel an, an obligation to do that. I, I also think increasingly more and more public pension plans, at least in my experience, are uh, interested in making sure this is on the table and is part of, part of the process. And that I do think we've seen some progress on over, over the last decade or so. And um, I noticed there's a, a question in chat about um, how worried should we be about that Department of Labor <laughs> regulation that would um, essentially uh, be punitive against ESG restrictions. Um, Susan or Heron, have you spent any time researching that? There's a letter going around um, that um, I'm happy to put in the um, follow-up. Well, um, I don't know how fast the follow-up is going to go. I'm happy to put something in about the chat, chat window where every single person on this call and every single person you know should be sending a note to the DOL about in you know about this issue because I think it's a chilling it's a chilling thing not to be able to use ESG as a factor you know as a valid um, factor um, in making investment decisions. But but I also want to again um, highlight the regulatory issue. This only affects um, private pension plans. It doesn't affect control. It affects, but it doesn't control public pension plans. It doesn't control foundations and endowment um, decisions, and it does not control individual investor decisions. And so uh, one of the things I think we can do is keep it scoped on where the authority is and not to lead to, and being engaged in really active dialogue about that is super important um, to not lose the momentum I have seen in the six years I've been at RBC in terms of adoption of ESG integration and impact investing and the willingness to participate. It's actually been accelerated by, by, um, by the pandemic and the desire to really be more engaged in how your money's being used. So absolutely, it's an issue. Absolutely, we should all be commenting. I'm ringing the bell on that. But also, absolutely, we should understand that this does not need to affect everybody and, and we should keep the conversations um, boundaried uh, in the places where if it does go through, it, it will for that sector, but it doesn't need to be. Um, and and a, a lot of um, pro corporate pension plans are, are, are really not are the market for the kinds of things we're talking about for the most part. So uh, it, it is more the public pension plan and the foundation and endowment world that, that certainly we at RBC think is important to the growth of this business. But every individual employee could be asking their, that, that works for a company that has a private pension plan could be asking for a gender lens and a racial and ethnic diversity lens on their, on their offerings. And there are almost none 
um, that's out there. And so I, stand, I mean, there. stand corrected, super important. And I'm sorry, I didn't think about that. Thank you, Suzanne, for, for pointing that out. It's super important. Yes. And we can all, all be demanding it. Like, why don't I have these options? I just say, Catherine, one thing I'm excited about for RBC, um, and we haven't talked about this before, is, you know, you guys did this deal with OMERS um, in the, the public, public pension plan in Ontario, Canada, and you guys did this deal with the Equality Fund, which is Canadian government money, the $300 million allocation around investing with a gender lens and granting with a gender lens. I mean, to me, there's another part of the solution set, which is thinking about new partnerships, thinking about new relationships, thinking about where you can find allies which are not necessarily like the traditional allies. And I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. Thank you, the checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you do need to think more broadly. Um, but I also think that it's a testament to, this resonates with a lot of different segments mm -hmm. and, and, and how to find those spots and align with those spots. We also have a women's leadership fund in Canada. In Canada. And so there, uh, you know, we do gender lens investing in the U.S. through some of our impact fixed income strategies where you can say, I only want to invest in um, mortgages to low to moderate income families that are female heads of households or small businesses that are female led or um, m minority populations. And so there, there are all these options out there. And, and, and we've also been noting, noticing more and more that uh, the, the real power of uh, these large organizations, such as RBC, is to actually listen to and hear what your clients want and then figure out how, how to get them there. And uh, that customization is, is more and more the norm, um, particularly for large institutions. Yeah. I'd like to circle back to that point that you brought up, Catherine, which is, um, you know, a lot of these larger pension funds do have uh, programs or are hiring people to look at diverse led funds, right? Um, but what we've noticed ourselves is that there's a lot of uh, people who are hired into positions that are kind of equivalent to chief diversity officers, which is there's a figurehead, they're presenting a lot of research, um, they're presenting maybe funds or attending a lot of conferences throughout the year, but the teams that actually have asset allocation power and uh, check writing abilities are completely separate. Um, so although these recommendations are presented to the funds, um, they're not necessarily invested into. So I think one of the, the rule breaking or maybe um, innovations is that when you're hiring people into these positions, they should actually either be integrated with these um, asset classes or um, the rules themselves need to be integrated so that it's not uh, an external body that's just presenting recommendations. Um, you actually need to track that progress through. Well, when I was at the New York City Pension Plan, we, we, we did address that, Aaron, and, and that was that every asset class team had to have an emerging manager contact person. And that's actually on the website and acknowledged as the contact person for emerging managers who want to reach out. And it's asset class by asset class as well as, well as you know, the overarching philosophy and, 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 um, and really you know, conversation engager. There are portfolio team representatives that, that, that um, can be contacted. And uh, uh, part of their judgment is, in their evaluations, is are you actually answering those emails? Which is actually another problem when you're a very large asset allocator, an asset uh, uh, investor. Um, we need to change who, where are women on investment committees? And we need to change where are women in the, I mean, how many people realize that the secretaries of state are the ones who have more influence than a lot of other state level um, actors on where the public pension fund money goes and where state treasury money is invested. And we need to look at some of those places where we have to inject, get more women into positions of influence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, Heron, to your point, you know, that it, it, is, it is wonderful to see people hiring chief diversity officers and, and creating an infrastructure organizationally. Um, but, but the way that, that, you know, the, the way that you also have to look at it is what is the, what, it, who are the decision makers on the investment side, who prioritizes, right? What, what searches are going on, who prioritize, who, who can, who has a vote obviously at the investment committee level, um, but who really can, inf and, and who can influence in sort of larger organizations, um, you know, uh, 
you know, very distinct sort of, uh, uh, at least in my organization, you know, and, and I know many uh, similar organizations, you know, there's a very distinct set of uh, people who have responsibility across origination and uh, investment analysis. And there's a lot, you know, there's a huge ecosystem that ha that has to take place to put one single fund um, on, <laughs> on the platform. But you have to have people who are in positions to make this a priority and to let um, to let people know in that organization that it is an investment priority um, in addition to having a it being an organizational and a cultural um, you know focus uh, and so I think Aaron just to pull that string a little I think it's really important we've had a lot of people on chat <laughs> you know talking about um, the importance of of who the decision makers are and the, the and the allocators are and isn't it a comment? Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Go ahead. I also think it's an education issue. And I, I, don't, I mean that in the, in, in the best sense of the word. I think there's really a lack of understanding. To my point, when I listen to current statistics, this is an investment opportunity. And if you're not paying attention and missing it, you're potentially leaving out some of the best and the brightest from your approach. And that is not because they're women or because there are people of color. But in order to get that seat at the table in the first place, they had to overcome so much more than, you know, all the people who had a cultural fit um, uh, didn't have to do. And that means that uh, they were that, that they were better. I used to say I was at Goldman Sachs as long as I was, um, but despite the fact that whenever we had to cut 10 percent, the number was, you know, 60 percent were women when we were a fraction of that at the firm because I actually did a good job. And so, you know, and so I overcome came the odds that the guys didn't have to. I was not part of that 60% cut of, of women. And, 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 and so that difference, the, the, the fact that we have to be better and work harder and have more hurdles to overcome to get to those seats is not in the lexicon of, of the analysis of, of, of those people who, who, who are put in front of us. And it's actually thanks to Heron's statistics that I've thought about, I've never thought about this before. Like, why don't you put these people into your thought process? Because why don't you think about that they had to be really stellar to get to where they are mm -hmm. and be in front of you? I got an amen, Catherine, from somebody. Thank yes. you. Well, I, I just, <laughs> I want to say that this is a moment. I mean, the COVID and the economic crisis and Black Lives Matter and all of the horrible things going on, to me, this feels like such a moment. And okay, I've been at this again for 20 years. I keep thinking, there have been different times when I felt like this is a moment, but I really think this is a moment where people are having to come to a reckoning about where is the diversity at all the levels of decision-making. And people are, if they're feeling the stress and the pain and the embarrassment, then we have to go for the jugular right now and say, yeah, then we, we have, here's a, here's a binder full of women and a binder full of black and Latina women and a binder full of people that can be in these positions. And you, there is just no excuse for you not to have people in these positions of decision-making around how investments are going to deploy. But, but there are also two things. And then I promise to shush because I've said too much and I always want to be respect, but I, I've gotten wound up. And as Anna knows, I get very on this topic, which may be why I'm in the room here. But um, I, think, I, I think there are two things. The first thing is, it is a moment, but it's also a moment where this is an imperative, not just in the investment business, but across everything. Yeah. We have the, the research on diverse teams making better decisions are so, is so clear, right? Down to um, diverse juries make better decisions. Like it's, it's in every, the studies are really, you know, broad and broad reaching and, and, and important. And if we are in a time that is unprecedented for at least the people who are alive today, right? If we are in this time, don't we want the best minds and the best decisions and the best teams working through this across the whole organization? And I think the, the other piece about this, which in, in, in marketing research, they know that in times of change, like when you get married, when you have a baby, when you retire, that's the most likely moment in your life as a brand, as a brand marketer to capture your attention to change brands. So why not change our DNI brand at this moment? Why not 
when we're in this moment of dramatic change, why not capitalize on that for the brand change to embracing DNI and, and the value it can bring at, in terms of all the things we've been discussing? And now I promise to share. <laughs> I agree, with, I agree with that, but the research has been so clear. For so long. You are management of a company, a, a multinational company to a local mom and pop store, and you are not embracing diversity and inclusion. You are derelict. Okay. I mean, it's, it's obvious. I vote every one of my own proxies because I only vote for the women to go on the board mm -hmm. because we still, it was only last summer where we got the last Fortune 500 company put one woman on the board. You know, yes, I can write and ask people to change, but I can also sit here at my computer and vote my own proxies. And so I love this idea of everybody calling up their HR department and saying, hey, I need some ESG choices here on whatever it is that float your boat. And um, one last thing, a lot of the um, people who we talk to about investing in our funds will say things like, well, you know, I have daughters and this is an important issue to me. And I just, the back of my head goes, didn't you have a mother? Oh. Uh, okay, I'm done. Heron, <laughs> are you seeing new kinds of people come in to illumine that were not the usual suspects? Yes, yes, we are. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, the traditional foundations who have an explicit ESG mandate or who have really thinking, been thinking about gender or race, I think are our, our sweet spot of advocates who very clearly see our mission. But we've also had a lot of uh, what we call non-traditional or maybe conventional investors who previously didn't think about these factors, but have seen so much client demand, as you mentioned, um, for all the panelists, that they actually hired consultants um, to search out for funds like us. Um, and on that consultant point, we actually had um, one LP fire their consultant because they had so much demand for our fund, but the consultant wasn't um, really doing a good job of evaluating us and bringing other funds to them that they actually had to switch out their consultant. So to the point that um, you brought up earlier, um, there is a, a great pool of uh, funds that are out there. So if your consultant's not doing their job, you have the power to change the consultant um, and actually incentivize people who are who are willing to see the opportunities in the market. Um, and, and to Joanne's point and Catherine's point about all these studies, I mean, there's so many that are out there between Bloomberg, Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, KPMG, that are citing how diverse teams perform better. Um, there's also a lot of studies that are actually looking at how funds perform better. So there was a Harvard Business Review report um, that showed that when venture capital firms increased their proportion of female partners, hires by 10%, they on average saw a 1.5% spike in overall returns and had 10% more profitable exits. Um, there's another Bloomberg report that showed minority and female hedge fund managers fared 72% better than their peers. So, you know, there's data out there that's showing that diverse teams um, at the entrepreneurship level, at the partnership level, um, perform better. Um, and I think what we see is that as, as LPs, you're considering how to minimize your risk across various factors, right? So you look at geography, asset class, vintage year, um, you know, any number of factors to really reduce your risk. But the one risk that um, we think LPs don't really diversify is the huge risk of having a homogeneous team. So, you know, I think it's because it's seen as normal. Um, you're, you're used to seeing uh, teams that look the same pitch to you. But that in itself is a risk um, because it means you're, you can't access a whole subset of entrepreneurs because these people don't have those networks or um, you can't invest into a set of industries that they're not as familiar with. And so, you know, I think a lot of the anecdotes you hear are um, male partners asking their secretaries or girlfriends or wives about pitches because they actually um, don't understand these products, right? So what you're doing is leaving money on the table by not having diverse teams. And if you think about your responsibility as a fiduciary, your responsibility is to invest into the highest performing teams, highest performing funds. So it's really your responsibility to, to diversify the teams that you invest in and therefore reduce the risk that you have of only selecting homogeneous teams. So I, um, we're, we're gonna get 
back to the, the, the call to action at the end of this uh, call, but I, I feel like there's been a lot of calls to action uh, in, just in this last uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes of conversation. I, I know we've been addressing a lot of the comments and the questions in the chat, but I do, you know, let, let's say for the next 10 minutes, would love to open it up to other participants uh, to, to ask burning questions. Um, so you, if you wanna just, I think you're free to just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Or I can read some questions from the chat. We can just yeah, we can answer those because you guys have been awesome in doing that. I think Imogen asked a really good question, which is: Is the language actually helping us or hurting us? Yeah. Um, and 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 isn't it better maybe just to talk about ESG or ESG plus? As I was on a on the phone with a group of guys the other day talking about gender lens investing, we're doing a piece of research within Gender Smart. We have sixty guys feeding us information about should should we just do ESG plus G? Or should we just do ESG and double down on the S and the G um, as doing better and better around thinking about gender and diversity as, as that? And um, given all the, um, the lift that ESG funds have had in the last six months during this um, pandemic, um, would that not be a better strategy? Um, and I think that this is um, something that we heard in Project Sage, we asked people, is it helpful for you to talk about gender? Is it not helpful for you to talk about gender? Is it helpful for you to talk about racial and ethnic diversity or not? Um, and there were people who said, you know what? I don't lead with gender. I lead with my thesis. I lead with my, lead with my climate thesis or my real estate, smart real estate development thesis or my sustainable cities thesis or whatever it might be. And then I will talk about gender or I'll be just representing, hello, two smart women fund managers. Um, but I think, Imogen, you raise a really good point. And I think that the, um, what we heard from fund managers was sometimes it really helps um, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and sometimes I think as an industry, we can say we need to keep hitting that um, it's, these are just smart, all of you have said, these are just smart strategies. It's about being smart investors. It's about what you're leaving on the table. But sometimes there is value in pointing out that we're, we're missing out on diversity um, but also recognize that when, I think Lisa Davis might be on the call from PGIM Real Estate, you know, when their fund gets backed and there's just a, you know, smart real estate fund, um, then they can also say, hey, by the way, we have, you know, look at these women in management, look at how we use gender as a factor of analysis in our evaluating our real estate partners or evaluating the, the benefits that we put in our real estate projects um, for, our, for our customers and our community. Um, and so, I think it's a it's a healthy thing to say. Is it when does it help us and when is it not as useful? Hey, it's Lisa. I'm here. Um, hey, <laughs> how you doing? Um, I think it I think it is a healthy thing. Um, what I want to see is I want to see the day when it's actually an advantage in getting an allocation. I want someone someday to say to me, "It was an you you were up against your biggest competitors who are all male led." And it was an advantage that you were female led and that's why we gave the allocation. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that's, what emerging, that's what emerging manager programs should have done, but they ended up being mostly, you know, spin outs, white male spin outs of, you know, pretty well backed partnerships as we heard before, right? And right. That, that has to change. Who else wants to Hi, uh, I had a question. Uh, this is Francis Adderhold. Um, I'm joining from Athena Capital Advisors um, and just sort of from the wealth management kind of perspective, um, I think it's really great to obviously hear about how to kind of direct capital um, in a more diverse way. But I was also curious um, in terms of just um, engagement with managers and engagement with kind of the landscape overall, um, whether the panel could kind of comment on ways that we can help kind of better assess um, manager diversity initiatives and um, are there kinds of policies that um, we can kind of push for or look for in order to kind of help incentivize managers to um, improve on, on these areas. So are you talking about things like DDQs um, and what you do in, um, in your diligence um, or how you um, are analyzing the managers themselves? Is that the question? Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of in, in diligence, but also 
you know, when you have um, relationships with managers, what are, I guess, ways that we can also um, Im improve their um, diversity representation um, over, over time as well? I mean, I think what's exciting is, again, ILPA has um, a DDQ that is around uh, gender and racial diversity, and they're updating it right now, but they published it in 2018. Um, and um, Blue Haven uh, and Stardust and a number of family offices. Stardust has, if you go to their website, um, a family office, uh, they're sharing a lot of things in their DDQ. And they're basically saying, look, either you have to have this, or if you don't, we're happy to work with you. Um, and some people are saying, I, I need to see it right from the beginning. And other people are saying, um, I'm willing to work with you. Actually, Heron, that's your strategy, right? And in, in part. So you want to talk about that part of your strategy? Yeah, so um, I'd say the general advice um, that we give to the, the manager or the LP community is to really examine the, your own processes uh, end to end from the sourcing point to the diligence point to the investment committee stage and to how you monitor the funds. So it's really hard to give um, kind of carte, carte blanche advice because it really depends on a firm by firm basis. Um, but some questions you can ask yourselves are, um, you know, who are you seeing in your pipeline? Do you actually have relationships with groups um, that enable you to access a diverse pool of fund managers? Um, once these funds are in your pipeline, then at what point do they drop off? Is it um, after the first meeting? Is it after your DDQ questionnaire? Um, is it during your reference checkpoint? Um, and what criteria do you see them struggling with? Um, is it the fund size that they're raising? Um, is it that they have to have X number of years of investing experience or a track record or be a spin out. So it really depends on um, how you yourself are evaluating funds when you're presenting them to committee. And then are the, the last thing I would say to evaluate is ask yourself if the number of steps that these funds go through and the length of the process that they're going through, is that consistent with other funds in your pipeline? So um, do you see that women led funds are in your process three times longer or um, are you asking them more questions than you ask other funds? Are you doing more reference checks? So um, I think if you really examine and reflect historically on what's happened in your pipeline and investment process, you yourself can likely tease out what the hurdles are internally that are um, perhaps preventing these funds from moving forward. And when, when our fund invests in a company, the first board meeting, we just make sure that we have a conversation about their hiring process and we don't ask anybody for a commitment for this because we only have one rule as I mentioned earlier but we ask people about what is your process to ensure that you've seen diverse candidates for every job as you're thinking about hiring because you can't change your diversity if you're not putting the people in the pipeline so that's one of the things we ask for. And there's a whole set of stuff out there that you can find. In fact, I could send it if you wanted. Any other, I want to take maybe one other, maybe relatively short question, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move to each of the panelists to ask for their one call to action or that, 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 uh, that they want the participants to walk away with. And then, um, you know, we can, we have, we have multiple sessions this year with multiple speakers and we can do a deep dive on anything that anyone who, uh, who has wanted to today uh, wants to. So, so please follow up and, 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 you know, we have future sessions where we're excited to do, you know, 401 on any one of these topics, if you will. But um, any, any quick questions before we uh, move to, to close today? All right, well, all right, so the, so Pat, we have heard about uh, we I, I love this I love this notion that you know activist hedge funds aren't the only activist investors um, you know and 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 that activating and asking questions and constantly um, making sure that people are thinking about this is is you know I think one call to action that any, anyone can do no matter what your role is at any organization. Um, but beyond that, um, what, what would be everyone's, you know, sort of single call to action that, that you would want people to walk away with today? 
So my, I, each, everybody on this call makes decisions every day about where their money goes. And my call to action is just to be very thoughtful about where that money goes, both your, your retirement savings, your uh, brokerage accounts, your spending dollars, think about where it goes. Suzanne and Catherine Heron, jump in there. To add to Joanne's point, I think, um, you know, one of the themes that came across this call is that we all have power, right? So whether you're a client, whether you're a consultant, um, whether you work at a pension fund, you all have the power to demand um, that the fund managers, that the entrepreneurs that are being funded look like the U.S. population, right? So it's not, um, it's not out of your reach uh, to keep pounding the table and to keep bringing up these issues and to ask for concrete changes um, that are measured and um, you know, publicly available while they're being measured. So you know, whether it's in demanding that um, your, your fund looks at a lumen or so many of the other funds that are in the market, um, we know that there are so many talented fund managers, so many talented entrepreneurs. So I think continuing to bring up these issues and showing that there's client demand will really help move that needle. Suzanne, Catherine. Catherine, you go and then I'll go. Okay. So I think this concept of use your power is super important. And I, I just, to me, that is um, your, your voice. And, and we've talked about a lot of the ways you can use your voice uh, in um, DDQs and in research questions and in asking people. It's super important to make sure that um, women and minorities are represented at large firms. So when they spin out, they don't face the problem. Suzanne said they don't have their own wealth to invest to, to enough in their, in their venture or in enough of a track record or, or bring their friends along who, who, who can support them at larger dollars. So I think that's it. Um, and, 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 um, and, and support the people in your organization who are underrepresented and need more voices um, internally and, and externally and just be conscious of it. We have a lot more power than we have used historically. Yeah. And this is a moment to step into it. Um, and I've been telling my friends that and my colleagues that, and now I'm telling a bunch of strangers on a panel call. <laughs> so know what you own, count what you own, track it, report on it, demand that people report. Um, we need better data. Um, I know Patience Marine Ball, who's a massive champion around better gender data, um, is on this call, um, demand better data. Um, vote what you own, um, and then um, really use this moment um, to 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 demand change and to and then to be there with the solutions. Um, and if that's printing out Project Sage and walking into your financial consultant and saying, "By the way, here's a hundred. You think there's no pipeline? Here's 138 funds." <laughs> Um, or that is um, going to as you so and seeing what the, all the proxy votes are that have anything to do with gender and diversity or I mean, there's so many resources that we have, um, but just own it and um, start somewhere. Great. Um, well, that I think is a great segue to uh, a follow up to this um, where we will send the notes from this call, the recording. Um, I, I think eventually we'll be on, online, um, but at least the notes and the resources um, it are, are two things that, that we will follow up with everyone who participated on this call. Thank you so much to the panelists. This has been, I, I'm super excited and not so excited to jump on my 1.30 call with a bunch of people who aren't thinking about this. <laughs> so, but I think I'm going to work it in there anyway, um, somehow. Um, but anyway, the, uh, thank you so much. Um, this has been an exhilarating discussion. Um, and Alyssa, let me turn it over to you to sort of go over uh, how people can continue to participate in both this uh, work stream on gender and diversity and uh, the three others that we have at High Water Women. So Alyssa. Awesome. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Anna, for bringing us all together and moderating this panel today. Um, so exciting. Lots of stuff to share. Look for a follow-up email coming from us uh, in the next day or so. Might not be till Monday um, with links to all the resources that um, were shared today by our panelists and by our audience as well. 
So two upcoming sessions for you to know about. They're on screen, Portfolio Construction, coming up on August 5th, and in September, Energy Markets and the Renewable Economy. Um, and we're adding sessions all the time, so um, be sure to check out our website, and we'll be posting things there. You can also sign up for our, our newsletter. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Um, also, before we go, need to get for becoming a High Water Women Impact member. It's 150 bucks a year. Uh, we use that money to underwrite uh, this work that, that we're doing um, and the network that, that we're building as a resource for all of you. So thanks again for coming and we hope that you have a wonderful day.